Eek as well in this Doomhammer Shaman. Not always included in these decks, but I, I kind of like it here. Really interesting inclusion for these. And uh, as well as double menacing Nimbus. I feel like even in regular elemental Shaman without Doomhammers, sometimes double menacing Nimbus isn't always included, but hopefully it's enough to keep some elementals going and just continue to keep things out on the board. But as we get into game number one, Pun has that early game that you were talking about. Yeah, sorry, what did I say about Paladin struggling to get on board <laughs> early? I'm talking absolute nonsense. Yeah, just draw like that. It's fine. Just draw every single low carve card in your deck. No, even with this aside, right, like Paladin does have a good number of low cost cards that they can literally play on turn one and turn two. It's just matching up the efficiency of that versus Kindling Elemental and Vapor and you know, Wind Fury Rush and all of these things that can come out from the Elemental Shaman on the other side. Generally, the Shamans just tend to have a little bit more initiative, which is kind of what you want to be going for in these kind of matchups, particularly uh, when you are going first. I would imagine the flip for the coin in this one was absolutely huge, and either player would have been delighted going first and kind of frustrated going second. Yes. Uh, although the the start here for Norwes, I have played a ton of Elemental Shaman myself, and that turn one kindling into a coin granite Forgeborn is just like chef's kiss. It's an absolute beautiful play, but still does get to at least get this out pretty early, which is definitely going to help in being able to keep that board. Maybe Pun can come back here. Oh, Samuro coming into hand as well. Samuro plus these buffs can clear up a lot of this damage, but it's still going to be a little ways out. Even with coin, there's just not enough damage to, or uh, there's not enough mana to put that damage out yet. How do you think Pun wants to maneuver these these next couple of turns here with drawing the Samuro now? It's actually really difficult, right? The fact that he hit exactly Samuro off the Skulker discount, right? The next card that was drawn was the Samuro, so it cost three instead of four. I think if that thing costs four, you'd be like, all right, that's probably too slow this <laughs> game. I'm not going to worry too much about it. But the fact that already next turn now, you can start to get in range of like Samuro Hand of a Doll. Um, you would be tempting to kind of lean into that a little bit because without that influence... You're just thinking about landing buffs this turn and then dropping parrots the turn after and just trying to snowball from there with consistent buffs coming down, right? But now I think Pun actually has a really split decision as to which way he wants to approach this matchup. Does he actually want to fight for board turn by turn? Or does he is he willing to concede being behind a little bit and use that Blade Master to catch up? And if he's doing this, that seems to suggest he's going a little bit further towards the second option, which is conceding board for a turn or two, using Blade Master for that swing turn later. Yeah, and interesting, this uh, Earth Revenant in hand as well for Norwis can help get rid of these Divine Shields that could be causing a little bit of trouble. But this is now a slightly interesting turn here i feel like finding the arcane eh, it's not really doing a whole lot but it's a decent sized body it is yeah the arcane luminary opens up some fairly interesting options in the future as well because of course he is going to generate another uh, random elemental which is uh, something to look for in the future but certainly the earth revan here does seem to be making the most competitive board state immediately okay he's going to go for it he's going to drop the nimbus looking for something a little bit different and then in this case he's going to stretch this out with the totem the getting the taunt totem is actually a little bit interesting with that samuro potential and if there was the interest of going the Samuro direction, that really changes things because it doesn't have any attacks. So it actually doesn't trigger that frenzy effect. True. It means Pun would have to unstealth this minion here instead of potentially going for something like a coin blessing of authority to create a gigantic stealth minion. Yeah, I do like this. I think without any real signifier that you, you know, if you don't have Blade Master in hand, there's no real reason to just start stacking huge minions just yet. 
Uh, I think you can address the board once and for all with that Blade Master this turn. Now from here, you're probably ahead or evenish on board by the time your opponent plays their turn on the following turn. And you can use this as a base and then just go Blessing of Authority, hopefully on a surviving minion the following turn. Look to uh, curve that out into parrots and so on from there. So puns two to three turn decision to uh, sit back a little bit and allow that discounted Blade Master to clear up is looking like it's going to work out pretty well. And you have to say it's a pretty low percentage line overall hitting exactly a discounted uh, Blade Master Samuro from your first SI7 Skulker of the game. So I imagine Norwis is pretty frustrated to see how quickly this game has, uh, has spun away from him. Yeah, I would say as well as the seemingly decent start with that Kindling Elemental into being able to play out uh, discounts and keep these uh, elementals going with the Forgeborn, but it just kind of faltered and, and didn't end up doing enough. But yeah, the the Samuro being picked up there, like you mentioned, and being discounted in addition to having the coin and a buff for it as well, just really has slowed Norris's plan down a lot. And this is exactly what you were talking about at the start of the game, where this is that board-focused game, board-focused decks, Pun found the Samuro, and I mean, in a board focused matchup, you can't ask for anything better than that. You really cannot. And Norwis now feeling under too much pressure, even really. Wow, okay, this one is going to end in a <laughs> hurry from this point forward, I am sure. Noble Mount can even come down here. Divine Shield can come on the minion that is attacking here just to preserve that little bit of health. Keep it out of range of the 3-2 trade coming back through the other way. And now with that Battle Master in hand, this one could be over sooner rather than later. But yeah, you can see the difference, right? Like subtract that Blade Master from this game. Norwis would have had minions attacking face and he would be backing that up with a Doomhammer Rockbiter. Now, having been forced off board, that Doomhammer Rockbiter is just just way too slow to have a real impact on this game. Yeah, and it's, it's very sad looking at it in terms of playing from that Shaman perspective because this feels like a great turn, right? Seven mana, got Doomhammer, Rockbiter weapon, this is what you want to be doing. But like you said, the way that this game played out, it's not doing anything. And instead of feeling good, it actually feels terrible and like it's just not enough. But... Is there anything that Norwis can even do at this point? I, I, I guess Rockbiter and try to kill this, but Bill, it, it feels like it's just delaying the inevitable a little bit at this point. It does. You kind of have to hope that your opponent's hand is entirely air at this point, and then you draw perfectly from this point, perhaps something to leverage that Bolner on the coming turns. But certainly any route to victory did start with that um, Rockbiter on the previous turn to, uh, to be able to clear this up. So. And now from Pan, just protecting the board a little bit with the... Righteous Protector there, keeping <laughs> keeping a taunt is really annoying for Norwest to have to deal with as well now because that Divine Shield, especially on top of the taunt, just makes the potential Rock Biter plan that Norwest could have been going for really awkward, but can hit into it once and maybe use the Canal Slogger. Still not going to be enough. Yeah, also, hang on, I looked away for a second, but wasn't this just lethal on the previous turn with Conviction, or am I miscounting? Like, conviction plus... Oh, seven mana, my bad, I thought it was eight mana. Okay, I take it all back, <laughs> never mind, <laughs> yep. pun's a genius. It was before the nerfs went in. A True. while ago, it's been a little while now, but we haven't seen much of this deck from that point to now, but... Now that's going to be lethal at this point. That uh, is going to be a fairly swift 1-0 for Pun coming out of that one. Again, I think it'll be a matchup he'll be very happy to have got out of because I think a few things were stacking up against him there. Again, I do think Shaman can win early board quite consistently and that Paladin is a deck that struggles if it loses early board because you kind of get stranded with a bunch of buffs and no targets that you can then throw on them. Um, so 
Then going second, being on coin, I think put him behind a little bit even further because he gives even more initiative over to the opponent in that position. But it was just that discounted uh, Blade Master coming out in that spot that was so, so clutch. Um, but credit to Pun, he recognized the route. He understood to slow play for a turn or two just to allow Norwis to extend into that board, especially because Norwis had landed Granite, right? So he knew that he would be vomiting out his hand because everything would be so cheap. Cleared it all up with the Blade Master and then from that point onwards, no real route back for Norwis into that one. Yeah, very, very fortunate there to get that. Like you said, the win with the Paladin and looks like going to queue up the Druid next. Now, this one is a little bit different than I feel like what we've kind of been seeing on broadcast today. It still has Mr. Smite. It still has the Anaconda and Celestial alignment, but this is kind of hearkening back to the I don't even want to say the olden days because it wasn't really like that long ago, but <laughs> this spell-based druid, which feels like we haven't seen in a while because that aggro taunt druid was so popular for what feels like so long. And then all of a sudden we had these changes and then also even for the most part for preparation and so far today for druid decks, we've seen a very minion heavy, but late game heavy minion deck and now we're seeing the spell druid yeah we are we did see uh, a spell druid earlier as well which it was absolute was no mr smite like it was almost fully old school at that point just going with the, the the classic celestial druid strategy that as i said at the time was kind of a terror throughout the grand masters season and particularly in that incredibly memorable winning moment for gabby right at the end of it as well but if we want to talk about mr smite this is him more in his natural habitat i would say as we go over to quest warrior one of the most popular decks in the field overall and i would say generally a pretty strong matchup against celestial variants of druid as well uh, just because of those early curves the amount of pressure that they can put on early um, and then also just their ability to actually do pretty impactful things if it does come down to celestial alignment you know your ability to just respond with a mr smite or even just a stonewall anchor man on that turn where they give you one mana is normally a significant amount of pressure and normally druid finds finds themselves scrambling to survive on those alignment turns. So um, having said that, we have seen the combo decks doing quite well against Pirate Warrior in general so far in this tournament. So we'll see which side of the coin we land on this time around. Yeah, this has definitely felt like one of those interesting matchups. And I'm really curious to see how this more spell-based version kind of ends up panning out in the matchup versus those more minion heavy matchups that we've been seeing because things like the glowfly swarm in particular can do one of two things it can either end up going wide on the board and soaking up some of those cannon hits preventing that damage from going to face or it can get on board and then the uh, the warrior has a very difficult time removing those because there's just not a lot of removal in these warrior decks although norwis is playing a bear of in this list uh, we haven't seen that in all of the lists today but you know if a glowfly comes down especially with something like the arbor up that we do see in hand for pun to follow up i mean that can just spell disaster and be game over for the warrior yeah, we did see in a previous series as well, uh, Swids was playing Stage Dives and Blade Master Samuro in his uh, Quest Warrior as well. So he had the two Anchormans and the Samuro to be able to pick up off those Stage Dives. And we did specifically see that interaction uh, with the Glowfly Swarm in a particular spot to really dig him out of some trouble. But back in this game, Pun had a pretty interesting hand to look at there. It's one of those things we have to break down. He chooses to double innovate the growth this turn, which probably indicates he's just going to slam Arbor up next turn just to try and buy some time. Um, but he did have the option to kind of hold out, maybe get super greedy, look for a bloom, something along those lines, uh, and then see if he could get a ridiculously early celestial alignment out of the equation by holding out. But I do think I like this line overall. Having just picked up Lunar Eclipse, though, he now has another option about whether he feels like uh, this 2-2 is particularly worth shooting on this turn. Yeah, I feel like Lunar Eclipse is one of those really interesting cards in this matchup because it's it's kind of a debate of do you want to play it a little bit earlier and stop those kind of early minions or do you want to save it for something like the South Sea Captain 
that is going to be potentially putting out even more damage or even a blood sail raider if that comes down in combination with a weapon and looks like not going to play it maybe holding out for that potential big turn three or even a cannoneer those are kind of the the biggest minions i feel like that the druid wants to be taking out with that lunar eclipse but it's not a bad option either to try to use it a little bit earlier to stop that damage and it could have also helped uh protect these arbor up treants a little bit as well yeah i think cannoneer is dead on right because i think in this particular instance it's very very close because like you said south sea captain is another option that you can play around but shooting that tutu actually protected one of your tree ants from south sea captain right which was actually a big deal um but the cannoneer in particular i know we were playing some test games um, I think it was uh, Raven on the Pirate Warrior, maybe Lorinda on the Pirate Warrior. And we were very quickly becoming aware that, you know, if Cannoneer sticks to the board, that's just a 7-3 that's hitting you in the face every turn as Druid, essentially, with the cannons going off with the attacks. That is a real scary situation to be in, especially when I imagine Pun is still looking towards some kind of alignment plan this game, because largely his hand is doing nothing else right now. Yeah. Uh, is this provoke coming out? It is. I really like this provoke use here as well to kind of protect the the captain. But again, we just talked about it. We see this lunar eclipse. This is not a great hand this turn for Pun, kind of shaking his head. Uh, celestial alignment is also something that's kind of interesting in these matchups, like you were talking about at the very beginning, where sometimes it can be a little bit of a detriment if they play it and then all of a sudden there's mr smite or some kind of large pirate that's all of a sudden there and there's nothing to do about it <sighs> this lunar eclipse felt like it had to come out here but it does certainly feel like a pretty weak turn yeah pun's deck is gonna have to be real kind to him from this position Anaconda off the top this turn, you play the jump, you play the alignment, and then the turn after you just top deck nourish or something. Easy game, right? Seems pretty straightforward to me. <laughs> oh, it was a six drop! Oh, it was so close! <laughs> it was so close. One just does not look pleased with this at all. I mean, he went in on this. He's still going to go for the Celestial Alignment, but it does it, it does feel a little bit worrisome. There's a weapon in hand. There's minions on board already. There is the potential for quite a bit of damage. We, we definitely talked about these lineups overall are just very aggressive. They're very initiative yep. focused. And this warrior deck is doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, right. that is a Nourish. So it was six drop into Nourish. I got <laughs> real, real close, but this is a very different world if that was the other six drop in this scenario. Pun has to go fishing. 11 yeah. damage being shown down on board right now. And I think just with the... Oh, no, he's already hit second stage of quest. Okay, I thought he was about to activate second stage of quest. Fair enough. I'm sure at this point he wishes he were completing that second part of the quest and not getting this, mm -hmm. this expensive Rakara in hand because like we've seen with a couple other matchups today, this is, this is just going to sit there and do nothing. <laughs> Sorry, Norwich just played his turn and then raised his eyes <laughs> to his webcam, raised his eyebrows and shook his head. He is expecting <laughs> to lose the game this turn to Lady Anaconda, but that is unfortunately not Pun's reality currently. So is there any other way he can scrap his way out of this? Starting with nature studies is awkward because anything that you want off nature studies is still going to be full cost. Like, even if you get solar in this position, solar is still going to cost the full two mana, so it's very hard to weave into your turn. However, you do get the advantage of innovate if you want to look at it that way around. 
So now it does have the ability to play two Scenarian Wards this turn, not quite in the conventional method that you are usually used to seeing with Solar Eclipse, but can still get it done. Needs this one to have a big, big impact on the board, though. No. That's not it. So 3, 6, 10, 14, 18 just on board, facing back the other way, right? This is just straight up lethal on board for Norwis. Yep, that is. <laughs> That is it. And you can tell, like you said, from Norris's kind of reaction, just, okay, let's, uh, let's see what happens. But it wasn't I think, the kind of gigantic, crazy, big druid swing turn that Norris was expecting. And instead, that aggressive, consistent pressure that he was putting on throughout that game paid off. Yeah, certainly. I think there was very little else that could have been done from pun side that game. I liked the decision based on drawing Arbor up to just double vay out the overgrowth because then you just get to curve out into the Arbor up. The in the most interesting decision, I think, for me there was his um, choice not to use the Lunar Eclipse on the turn where he played the Arbor up, which then meant his Arbor up got dealt with very easily um, by the South Sea Captain that was in the hand on the other side. But I can't really disagree with that decision either, because even in that scenario, you still want the Lunar Eclipse to then take the South Sea Captain off the board on the other side. Otherwise, it's just going to be way too much damage building up over time before you get that alignment down and then... With the hand that he had, he recognized it had to be an alignment game. He was going to live two turns, maybe ambitiously, from that position, which he did. And he just needed his deck to be kind to him in those two turns. He wasn't quite able to get there. But you can certainly see the uh, the trauma that is caused from losing to Anaconda Druid. Because I feel like whenever alignment comes down, you just assume you're going to die the next turn, right? Like, that's just the effect the deck has on you. And I think Norwis was absolutely in that mind space as well. But he will now be very, very pleased to get out of that one with a win. Yes, and we'll see if there is going to be an alignment and or similar alignment reaction this game because Pun is bringing that Druid back and holy ramp, there's a lot going on in this hand for Pun right now. Yeah, crucially, he has his hands on the Fungal Fortunes as well, which is a very, very big deal. It means that he's not going to be playing with the same kind of dry hand as he did previously. That will be super important here. Norwis went very aggressive for Mulligan, looking for the most impactful possible start in this scenario. Pun, I would imagine his principal debate here is between one and two overgrowth and see how greedy he wants to be with the entire hand. And in the end, after much deliberation, he keeps the lot. Job's done. I'm really curious to see if there's going to be a really aggressive start again from Norwis as well. Uh, we do see that Forgeborn in hand. No kindling yet. Mm -hmm. But at least some, some curve minions to be able to get something going. Yeah, a little bit slow, though. A little bit unimpactful. 2-2 two, two into 2-3 two, into 4-4 four, four is not the absolute terror start that you could have against Druid in this position. And particularly now where Pun is off to a very fast start himself... It might be uh, just a little bit on the slow side for Norwis. I do think this matchup is very, very close. Um, you do have all the aggression that you need, generally, as Shaman, to be able to put tons of pressure on the Druid. But the Druid has some nice tricks in the matchup as well. And I think, in particular, overload for the Shaman is something that's very, very scary. Because anytime you overload, they will snap alignment in response on the other side, as long as you're not dead on board. Because you will straight up skip your turn <laughs> due to those, those overloaded mana crystals. Yeah, and losing a turn as a more aggressive initiative focused deck never feels good, right? Like, it feels so bad, especially after a pretty slow start. So if it comes to that, I'm sure Norwis will not be thrilled to see that. See a, a slight grimace there as that uh, second overgrowth comes out as well. Nature waits for no one but me. This is very interesting as well, opting for getting the card draw rather than playing the uh, Granite Forgeborn there for discounts and a better body.
Yeah, just trying to make sure he's staying as high on resources for as long as possible, making sure he can explode on uh, individual turns and try and do, you know, aggressive things, do things in bunches instead of just playing, you know, individual minion each turn from this point onwards, which I do like. Meanwhile, Pun just marching on with his uh, his day, ramping up as much as possible, now has access to that alignment as well. So as I mentioned, it's the timing of that alignment that I think will be uh, the most important in this scenario. Yeah, I really like this pickup of that best in shell as well. I was looking, there is not even a single copy of best in shell in this deck, even though I feel like we have seen at least one copy in a lot of the lists, and sometimes the oh, no, more spell-heavy druids can be running it, but uh, Pun is not running a, a copy of it at all, so getting to pick up one copy there seems great. It looks like maybe was really debating about potentially uh, taking that Scenarian Ward as well for additional armor. Yeah, certainly was deep in the tank on that individual decision. Hand is looking pretty solid for post alignment right now, it has to be said. And even with that solar turtles combination in hand, he actually is able to put up a ton of defense. If it starts getting towards, you know, Doomhammer and aggression from minions, he will be able to put up that big wall. It usually is a huge uh, stopping block for what Shaman can do to be able to put that many taunts in the way. But right now, Norwis just continuing to march on, dodging Overload as well, which I think is a very, very big deal in this scenario. Do not want to give your opponent that free turn, which they would absolutely still take in this scenario. So Pun is just going to drop the alignment, but Norwis has played around this very nicely from this position. And now you see the hold on the granite. This is why Dawn Norwis has been as greedy as possible, because now he can slam the granite, and that means all of these one-mana elementals now cost cost zero. Yes, I think this is one of my favorite things to do as Shaman, second only to the Kindling Coin Forge born <laughs> in some matchups as well. But yeah, getting to discount these is incredibly powerful. The interesting thing that I'm looking at is that Baron Geddon, it's a big body and can push a lot of damage, but it also would take out quite a bit of Norris's own board. So I'd imagine that's probably not going to be coming down. But I do also love the setup where just in case there was something that, that kind of went awry with the plan of waiting for that celestial alignment and the follow up Forgeborn is having these doom hammers in hand as well. So maybe if the Forgeborn couldn't come down, could just play a doom hammer instead. Honestly, like, I don't even mind that much getting the Geddon down here and, like, clearing off some of these smaller minions on board just to make room for bigger minions. I think if Pun had slightly more health, that might be a consideration you would go for here, but this board is comfortably threatening lethal in this position anyway, so I think just holding out in the spot is a, a relatively good idea. But now you see this fantastic hand from Pun so far being able to do work in this position. Fungal Fortunes can be cast still. Nourish is available to go back up. And that Solar Centaurian <laughs> twice over the course of a couple of turns here, which is pretty fantastic. I think Norwes just waiting to see how scary this board gets for Pun. Uh, kind of expecting the worst, I would imagine. Oh! That, oh! that might be the worst for Norwis. That might be one of the worst things that Norwis could have seen there. Oh my goodness. Those are some Blize 8s if I've ever seen them. <laughs> the, the, taint, the Taint Heart is not the absolute game ender that it is the other way around. Like if you randomly generate uh, a Taint Heart against Druid, the game ends. Like they can't do anything from that point. So it's not that disgusting, but just as an Iron Bark Protector, right? Like an 8-8 Taunt in this scenario that also gained you 8 armor, absolutely disgusting. And I haven't even mentioned Marg Forge Fiend yet, which was significantly the better of the two outcomes in this spot. Yeah, absolutely incredible. The one benefit I think for for this on Norwich's side is having those elementals at that zero, like you said, so able to make some trades that wide turn decision last turn, keeping all of these two health minions on board might pay off with these trades able to come into play here. Ooh. 
base tanking eight like an absolute champion. Does have the canal slogger available though to be able to heal up most of it. Uh, Pan, I think, will be slightly bummed out by how easily that was dealt with on the other side. That was a lot of reactivity that Norwis had in the hand that you know, was probably a little bit above average. But breaking things down overall, A, the fact that he had ramp into Celestial, great. The fact that he was then able to hit Solar Scenarian, great. And then the fact that those two minions came from his Solar Scenarian, I think he will be more than pleased with where he's at right now in this game. Absolutely, and and even more things to do this turn. A uh, Mr. Smite that's going to draw another one mana. Mr. Smite seems like a great option here. Also has the Lunar Eclipse to try to clear something off of the board. Best in Shell to put more taunts on the board. I mean, I, I feel like Pun can just take this turn whichever way he wants to, and it doesn't feel like it's going to go badly for him at all. So what you're saying is uh, Smite, Smite, Turtles, Lunar Solar Scenario. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Let's let's yeah. do that. The whole hand. Just get it all out there. What is this heathen order? I suppose doing the Scenarian Ward as early as possible does actually make sense because not only... Okay, yeah, Germination comes down. Not only can you get Germination down, but there's also eight drops that kind of support you playing spells later in the turn in that scenario, so that does make a good deal of sense. But now, having seen the Troublemaker, Pun will just chill on the rest of his board development and let the Ruffians do the work for him. 41 health, a bigger board than Norwis can ever hope to deal with. Uh, this one's looking pretty over. Yeah, there was there was a lot of damage potential, a lot of early and mid game pressure coming out from Norris. But this is that point in the Druid game that we saw really kind of he was expecting in the previous game that didn't end up happening. But <laughs> here it is. Multiple turns of getting armor, creating large things, putting out these threats and even with this Baron Geddon, it's not even enough to clear off those ruffians completely either, let alone the even bigger minions that are on the board. Yeah. The uh, combination of the Revenant and the Geddon is, at the very least, a big deal here, though. Being able to take care of all the ruffians, but there's still so much power yeah. left hanging around. And it's just the issue of... That Troublemaker in particular having Taunt means there's no way for Norwis to allocate all these breakpoints how he would like to. If he was able to spread each of those attacks he'd made into a different minion on the other side of the board, he would actually have a, a very effective board clear here, but the way it breaks down, no such luck. And that is going to still be a huge board on the other side for Punk. Yeah, and I, I think for Norwest as well, having to use multiple things and still not even get a full clear is just also removing more, <laughs> more tools from his hand, which is just whittling down to almost nothing at this point. And I mean, doesn't even matter what's in hand because with that copy of Mr. Smite, that's going to actually close out that game, putting Pun up two to one in this series now. Only has one more win to go. Yeah, big win in the end, in uh, Norwis even just handing back Lethal on board, basically, because he would know about the other copy of the Mr. Smite in that position, since it came from the, uh, the Moonlit Guidance. But nothing really he could have done in that position. Like the way he played it, obviously, as we were saying, curved out early without the Granite Forgeborn, uh, which you know, it's a point of debate, right? Because you kind of give Pun a little bit more time to find alignment if he doesn't already have it in his hand by being less aggressive with your early game curves. But the payoff afterwards is so monstrous when you get to discount your entire hand down to zero and start loading out. So, um, so I generally do agree with going for that strategy and he chose to do so. Um, it was just the absolute power of that back-to-back -back solar scenario. And I think most importantly, the first Solar Scenarian being as powerful as it was with essentially two Iron Bark protectors in that scenario. The uh, the extra armor that came from the Moog Forge Fiend didn't end up being you know, relevant to the game state at all, but just two giant 8-8 eight, eight taunts plus 16 armor in that spot was, I think, a little bit too much for Norwis to ever be coping with. Yeah, there definitely could have been uh, different results there. Uh, I'm thinking. I'm looking at you, Natalie. Eight one. 
nobody likes that. <laughs> but moving into yet another aggressive deck, we have some Face Hunter with some very interesting inclusions that we've started to see pop up ever since the, the mini set and uh, some of these changes have come about more recently. Things like this Doggy Biscuit, the uh, Arcane Anomaly, and this deck from Pun, even including a Moonfang. Yeah, Moonfang in at the top end as well, alongside Ramming Mount. And I know uh, Raven has been a big advocate for the, the spell package and the Arcane Anomaly in Hunter. Uh, I did mention that I was seeing Moonfangs in some people's lists. Asked him if he tried that out. He said, not really. It feels like with the, uh, the Arcane Anomaly stuff going on that you can just make these huge minions so quickly that you don't really have to worry too much about getting foot to Moonfang. But, you know, once again, ladder, different beast to tournament. If you want to be targeting and, and hunting down particular things with your Hunter, having that Moonfang in there can certainly in, uh, improve a match or two along the way. <sighs> and speaking of that arcane anomaly, we see it coming into play here as well as being on the coin, which is just going to increase that damage there. And uh, there, there are some answers in the shaman deck that could come out, but we don't see them. And there wasn't the turn one kindling to even try to get those out in play that following turn. So it looks like Norwich just has to kind of tempo out this Bulner and hope it's enough to fight back on board. Well, I guess the adorable infestation could come out on top of this arcane anomaly. No, actually just going to buff up the Og Merchants. Double trade here. It's pretty reasonable. Try to spread out the, the health on all of these minions. Fun knows there wasn't an elemental played on turn two as well, so that just continues that slowdown of the shaman chains of elementals that could potentially be coming out as well. So I really do like that line from Pun. Norwich just has to try to play out something. Does find the Granite Forgeborn. I don't know if it's going to be enough, though. It does feel pretty slow at this point, and still no elementals being played to continue that elemental chain. So the, uh, the Gyre Worm feels pretty empty at this point. But Canal Slogger is pretty great in this match and maybe turn things around, but might be saved a little bit. Still at full health right now for Norwest. Yeah, sorry about that. Brief technical issues, but I'm sure you handled it admirably in my absence. And while I was gone, it appears that Pun has developed quite the serious amount of uh, of board control in this spot. But as I just heard you say as I got back, that Canal Slogger is probably the card on which Norwis is hanging most of his hopes in this position, I would say. But still the problem of that arcane anomaly on the other side has to be dealt with because we do see the potential now for this uh, big ramming mount swing turn yeah ramming turn with that immune just spells disaster it almost feels like for norris pun being able to continue this board and even though this arcane anomaly has not Ooh. really gotten buffed gigantically okay that's a card that norris, is norris a has card. to think about it now Scanning for Hearthstone cards, <laughs> one Hearthstone card detected. Yeah, I mean, I think, so there was a really, really difficult turn for Pun, honestly, as I, I got back halfway through it. Like, he roped there, and he has been quite a slow player throughout this series and throughout his Masters Tour runs that we've seen so far. But I do think in particular that turn, he had so many things to consider, right? Because if he goes all in on one minion, like say, for example, he puts the ramming mount on the anomaly, suddenly then he's concerned a little bit about Canal Slogger. But going wide even a little bit more, I think he's then concerned about oh, yeah. Revenant because he's leaving too many one health minions on the board. Spreading out this way, he's concerned about something else. Like all of the outs from his opponent, I think he had to consider in different ways in this spot. Yeah. <sighs> It's really tough because it's one of those you can't play around everything. So he just kind of had to hedge his bets and figure out what is it that he did want to try to play around if he were playing around anything. 
but at this point now, five mana, probably not going to be a doom hammer unless he really wants to get that on a board now. Mm -hmm. But I'd imagine he wants to try to deal with some of these minions on board. Stormstrike and the Gyre Worm can kind of help uh, stifle some of this damage off of the board here. Not going to deal with everything, but it's something. Yeah, and I think having seen the Warsong Wrangler on the other side, that's going to make his situation feel even more desperate, right? He is still too busy talking about puns play, but, you know, Norwest line on the previous turn, he kind of sat back and accepted 7, 8, 10 more damage um, coming back the other way to try and set up that big tempo swing turn himself. But I think he would have largely been wagering that there was no Warsong Wrangler-Rhino combination coming back the other way when he did that, because now I think with the line that he's gone into, there's no real way for him to stabilize quickly enough in this spot against the amount of damage that he's taking back the other way. Yeah. It kind of feels like You it's... see, head, head down, head in hands, <laughs> and he now gets the bad news that the Rhino is coming out. That is five more damage coming out, and now even this Canal Slogger is just looking a little bit ineffectual in this situation. There's enough mana at this point now for this Arid Stormer that just came into hand and Canal Slogger, but again, kind of like the previous game, it almost just feels like it's just going to put him back in the same situation. It's just delaying the inevitable, it feels like. You have to go for the Earth Revenant instead, perhaps, of the Canal Slogger. It, it's it's tough to try to miss out on that damage, or the, the healing, excuse me. That feels pretty bad to miss a, a potential healing there, but I don't know if it's even going to be enough. Yeah, some weird lines you can take, even where perhaps you just leave the Rhino up on board. Like, if you really want to invent uh, like an ambitious win condition, you can, like, Earth Revenant away the 1-1s one -ones, and then value trade the Canal Slogger into the Warsong Wrangler on board to try and say to your opponent, okay, this Rhino isn't doing a significant, a significant amount of damage into my 2-6 Torn anyway, and then you still have to commit something else to deal with the Canal Slogger to uh, stop it from healing again, but that is incredibly ambitious. Like, I think you have to be very desperate before you get that kind of line into your head. I just wonder whether the position might be desperate enough for Norwis to do that kind of thing. Yeah, that was going to be my question, is do you think it was desperate enough? Because it almost felt like it. And now, also, with both Doomhammers in hand and just playing out that Cage Mash Custodian, that also just gave the information to Pun that two of the three cards in hand are heavy-costed weapons. Yeah, absolutely not what you want in this scenario. It has not looked like a very good meta for Doomhammer just yet in the matches that we have been seeing this, this Shaman be playing out. Rhino number two coming out here from uh, Pun. Looks like he's going to use Wound Prey just to clean up this 2-2 nice and easy. Push three more damage. Rush in the Hyena down to six, and he's going to need to find yet another way to clear this up, which he does have with the Canal Slogger, but that's basically his entire turn at this point. Yeah, it, it definitely is feeling desperate right now, and I don't even know if, if trying to go for a hero power into Taunt is going to be good enough, so it looks like Norris just says, I can't even rely on the totem at this point. I need to try to just push some damage, I guess. But do you, do you think this is going to be enough? I mean, Hunter just is able to compile so much damage. Yeah, it does not look particularly close from where I'm sitting. I do like the opportunity to go discount into weapon as opposed to going for the, ta the Taunt Totem, as you say. Um, I've... I think he needs to have some attempt to race from this oh, position, yeah, right? Yeah. Like top deck fire heart into rock biter, rock biter, like something ridiculous in that situation to be able to get out of it. But even then it feels like he's probably a turn too slow. There was, I was just about to add, the one silver lining is that Pun's hand is still board based, which is weird at this stage in the game for Face Hunter. But having now picked up a quick shot, he uh, should be able to accelerate this one quickly enough to get over the line. <laughs> 
the more cards that get played by Pun, the more head shaking is going on from Norwis as well. <laughs> just continuing that uh-uh. that shaking, and it's yeah, that is not the draw that Norwis was hoping for. I, I I feel like you you hit it on the head there that potentially a Fireheart out was the kind of save there, but not going to find it. It's not going to happen, and that's going to be the the series there ongoing three yeah. one. huge win for pun again just to recap all the way back to the start of the series where we set this up both of these players are in gm contention uh pun currently in possession of one of those promotion spots he is in second place overall in the america's standing at the start of play today obviously that position now showing potential to improve with the fact that he's gone through day one with a 4-0 record and americas have long since needed a champion and pun is actually if he picks up a chunk of points to go on top of this he already has 17 points let's say he picks up six or seven more points to goes to 23 24 ends up being gm promoted 20 plus is not an amount of points I would make fun of in terms of being promoted into America's Grand Masters, right? Which is a big deal in comparison to some of the other ones that we've seen. Um, on the other side, though, Norwis actually still in contention for European promotion, but he needs big, big points. He had 14 points to his name going into this one, but the cutoff for Europe is generally higher than it is for the other regions. So he was hovering somewhere around, I think, 13th, 14th in the standings overall to be promoted. So he needed big points on the line, and him now, having picked up a loss uh, as early as round four, is going to make that a lot more difficult going forward. Yeah, I mean, there's still another full two days of play here. One more full day of the Swiss rounds. But let's take a look at how today's Swiss rounds have gone so far. Look at these standings. Tons of players so far that have started out very, very strong with 4-0. Matty, you absolute freak. Like, I, I, I looked this up, okay? When I, I was looking up Gabby's stats, and then I discovered that low-key, there's a player from the Czech Republic called Matty who just had ludicrous Masters Tour stats, right? He's a player I'd heard of, but he wasn't a player that was on my radar as being one of the best players in the world. He had around 66, 67% win rate in Masters Tours. I believe at the time I looked it up, he was the highest win rate player with a significant sample size outside of China. Since then, he's now pushed that up to 70% going into this tournament. And now he's 4-0 again, going through the first four rounds of Swiss. Who is this person and why are they not winning every single Hearthstone tournament? I don't understand. Yeah, that is insane. I mean, even just some of these results that we've seen from other players that you can see on here, like Fury Hunter, incredible results over these last Master Tours, really making a name for himself. Where is Maddie? We need to see some Maddie on stream, I think. And, you know, <laughs> some of these other players that are are really performing incredibly well and and they're doing it yet again in this Master Tour so far. Yeah, we'll say this quietly because I, I do want to hype him up as much as possible. Last time Matty appeared on stream, he really didn't play that well. So maybe we okay. should just maybe we should just leave him off to, to do his thing, um, and he can ad- he can adapt to the camera a little bit later on if he uh, starts picking up the big results. But yeah, I think it's a good shout out from you as well, Fury Hunter, having that incredible outside shot to go for back to back Masters tours, which, you know, a year or two ago we would have said that as commentators, like, wow, he could win back-to-back Masters Tours. And people would have been like, yeah, shut up. Like, that's <laughs> never going to happen. No one's, no one's going to win a back-to-back Masters Tour. And then the man himself, Blythe, stepped up and actually did it. So, yes, that is a thing that is very possible. Congratulations to Fury Hunter. That's a great 4-0 run through that one as well. But that is just the setup. As Dawn said, we have two more days of this left to go. Yeah, and I'm sure there are quite a few players that are sitting at that three and one record after today as well that we we didn't get to see in that standings because it was all uh, four one. But, you know, I am incredibly thrilled that I got to cast this today and we saw some really great games and I am so thankful. Thank you for casting with me and all the rest of the crew today. It was an absolute pleasure. And we will have Lorinda joining the rest of you all tomorrow and Sunday to close out this Masters Tour. But you have any final thoughts as we close out for game, uh, day number one? 
No, I will just you know say on your behalf, you know, you are just joining us for today. So Dawn, thank you for joining us. I think you've done a wonderful job. Hope I get to cast plenty more with you in the future. And I guess before you sign us off for the day, I will just ask you, what are your highlights of your uh, first day casting a Master's Tool? Oh my gosh, that's, it feels like a loaded question because I loved so much of it, but I really was grateful to be able to cast with all of you. And uh, my personal highlight, I would say, would be kicking off the show this morning with Gia. Uh, you know, as as a woman in the scene, Gia has definitely been one of those role models that I've looked up to. So being able to kick things off and cast with her was definitely incredible. But you know, being able to really see some play mixed in from both these really well-known players and some kind of up-and-comers that we might not have seen before and kind of see them play really, really well on stream, which there's also that added pressure to play and perform well on stream as well. But we've gotten to see that and I, I love when we're able to see that. So I'm glad that we did get to see that some today. Yeah, I think that's absolutely a right way of putting it. Masters Tours, that's what it's all about. It's seeing the up-and-comers clash with some of the established veterans, and it's about those races for uh, for Grandmaster promotion positions. And as Dawn was saying, two more days of that yet to go. So I'm looking forward to uh, two more fantastic days of action. Absolutely, me too. So thank you to all of the production team, the whole casting crew, and from Subtle and myself. Thank you so much for hanging out with us for this day number one. Come back tomorrow. We will have those next four rounds of the Swiss. And we will see you all back here tomorrow for day number two.